I'm excited about this message. We said we're doing a series called Transformation, Transfiguration, Translation. And it is somewhat atypical in the sense of uh, those words themselves. When you hear the word transformation, especially when you hear the word transfiguration, that really could freak some people out, because, you know, type of thing. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, that when we enter into the presence of God, that we're being transfigured from one degree of glory to another. And then translation is just how it becomes a practical part of our lives, amen? In our homes, in our, with our children, our family, and just our seeking God when we're going through a hard time and we're, uh, God asks us to share the, the word with somebody. And, you know, uh, we've, you know, it's difficult because we fear rejection and the natural, but God puts us over, amen? Yes. I'm just real excited today because, I, I, you know, the word is so powerful. And that song we, we sang, uh, He'll Come. We're going to sing it to the end just to, just to conclude the service with it because it's so real. And uh, just to enter into a short summary, we shared that the word transformation, I shared in Hebrews uh, 12 to transfiguration, I shared in Mark 9, Luke 9, and Matthew 17. And the word translation it's all from the same word, metamorpho. We are familiar with the word because of the word metamorphosis. You know, how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And we shared a lot last week in our introduction in the context of how God's desire, his will, his main destiny for us is to conform us into his own image. Amen? Romans eight twenty nine. That's the highest calling you will ever enter into. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, what your title is, whether you're the pastor of the largest church in the world, whether you're uh, entrepreneurial and that you make so much money or you have a title of doctor or whatever, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is to the degree that we're conformed to the image of Jesus. Glory to God. You know, I, I get asked a lot, you know, uh, you know, where should I go to church and type of thing? And, and I always tell somebody, you know, you, where you're in agreement with, obviously, where the Bible's taught and evangelism, the spirit of God, etc. And I, I just ask yourself a simple question. Where do you believe after a year you'd be most conformed to the image of Jesus? And people say, I never thought of that. And I said, it's as simple as that. You know, that's, you know, that's what, you know, that it needs to be the basis of everything. Amen. Conform to the image of Jesus. That's amazing. When you look at yourself and say, my destiny is to be conformed to the image of Jesus, Romans 8, 29. That's amazing. And we sure did. It's a process. You know, uh, you don't get saved one day and then the next day, bang, you're there. Amen? You know, a caterpillar doesn't turn into a butterfly overnight. And it's a process. A lot of people don't like process. Amen? Because it involves work, it involves patience. That word so many of us do not like. You know, it really does. But process is good because if God just did it all at once, you'd never know who really wants it. Amen? I mean, it's, whether it's an athlete, you know, having to go through practice, whether it's, you know, when you're in school, having to, you know, take classes, whether on your job, there's a learning curve, in your marriage, amen? How I many know that's a process? Everything we do is a process. The Bible talks about starting off as a mustard seed and then growing into a tree. So, but the most exciting thing is that we're going to get there. When you can look at yourself and say, it's not because of how great I am, because we all have weaknesses, amen? We're not, you know, the apostles weren't the 12 people that were most likely to, to succeed in their class, amen? And there's nothing wrong if you were most likely to succeed in your class, but the bottom line, it's not about anything, but just saying, God, I want you, amen? And that's what's so, that's what's so exciting. You know, we have David Hogan coming, and, you know, in November, he's a guy that was not most likely to succeed in his class, 
And he started over, what, 10,000 churches? Won over a million people to Jesus? Has seen miracles that basically very few people have seen. You know, a, a number of people without legs receiving legs right in front of them. I mean, num- numerous people. We have the, you know, on the miracle tape, the leper that had no fingers, no toes, a man-seated nose, man-seated ear. I mean, you know, just basically just barely alive, accepted the Lord. He still could hear. And uh, David led him to the Lord. And I mean, God gave him brand new fingers, toes, feet, le- everything. And, uh, but the bottom line is this. As we enter into this, what I want you to see is this isn't about somebody else. It's about you. Amen? Because it's about God in you. And nobody is less ordained, less predisposed to enter into anything less than, man, being conformed to the image of Jesus. So I just want you to be excited, okay? Go with me. Uh, well, let's, Romans 12 too, if you would. And I, I believe that when we're done uh, today, you're going to be more excited than you ever have been before. And it's just going to be a good deal, okay? Romans 12 too says, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed, metamorpho, by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, we know that the world, the enemy tries to get us to conform to the image of the world. Amen? And the world has an image. Man, they have what's politically correct. They have, you know, it's amazing, not on a lot of college campuses. I was just uh, listening to something on the news that uh, at uh, University of Southern California at UCLA, that, I mean, if you even have another opinion, for example, you believe that there's only one way to heaven, you're not allowed to voice that in class, during discussion, or even to somebody else that, you know, you might be in the cafeteria and say, yeah, I just believe this. That you would actually go before a council of three students and a professor by voicing something like that because of it being politically incorrect. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's for real. And the world has an image they want you to conform to, and they will pressure you into that image. Amen? By the songs you hear, the, the television, uh, you, know, you know, what you see there, and, and, and the music, whatever it is. And uh, but God has an image, amen, he wants to conform us to. And I believe that God's going to win, amen, in our lives as we give ourselves to him. So it says that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In Proverbs 23, 7, there's a principle. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, means this. If you, what you really believe about yourself is what you're going to become. I'll never forget years ago when I was teaching high school and I was coaching uh, track and cross country, I was driving two young men home. They're both uh, juniors in high school and they're both good runners. And the one young man, he came from, I mean, about the worst side of the trucks you could ever think of. And I'd been in his house uh, trying to help him out as Dad was in prison. He had two brothers were in prison. He had two sisters that were in prison. And his mom just had a lot of issues. And it was just one of the worst houses I've ever been in. And then the other young man, his uh, dad owned uh, two Dairy Queens in town. And uh, so we were just talking about where you thought they were started the conversation. Where do you think you're going to end up after high school? And the one young man said, he said, I know I'm going to be in prison. And he said, I, you know, just matter of factly, I know I'm going to be in prison. And after high school, I, I did everything I could to try to help him, but he ended up in prison about a year or two after high school. The other young man said, I'm going to be a millionaire by the age of 30. He said, I'm going to have 20 Dairy Queens. And uh, he's very successful today. Very, very successful. And, uh, but see, as a man thinks in his heart, So is he. God wants to take us to a place where we're so confident in who we are and not only in who we are, but the tools that we have to get to where we're supposed to be. 
when we look at the word of God and we're gonna look at it in, in, a, in a very powerful fashion today, I, you know, we're so familiar, you know, you hear you know, the word of God, the word of God, and sometimes we don't really get all that the word of God is. But I believe God is gonna just come, I just sense the spirit of revelation to show us that it's not just thinking who you are, but really understanding the tools that God has given us to get to where we're supposed to get to. Amen? Uh, I'll never forget, uh, a while ago, there was uh, uh, a guy that we had discipled in campus ministry, and he brought a young lady in for uh, counseling. And, uh, and, and see, the devil will always try to minimize and to mislabel. He'll always try to get you to misperceive yourself, to misperceive others, to minimize your destiny, and to minimize the tools given you to enter into destiny. Well, this one, so she came in, and really nice girl, and uh, she had transferred from a community college in her junior year, and, and she's struggling. And so she opened up and just shared, and she said this. She said, when she was in, I think, third grade, uh, she was having problems in school. They gave her an IQ test, and she came out very low, and she was labeled, uh, back in those, the educatively mentally retarded. And so she was in a class for the mentally retarded until her junior year in high school. And a psychologist, and usually they don't do this, but they uh, reevaluated her and found out that all this time, uh, she had a hearing deficit, plus her peripheral vision was affected, and she tested not just average, but above average. So they took her out of that class. Can you imagine being in this class for eight years, and now she's in a regular class, and she struggled to begin with, but she did well her senior year. Well, she's at college now after transferring from a community college, and you're always going to go through some classes that are hard. And every time she would struggle, the enemy would, of course, say what? You're this, you're this. And she was just in a real battle. And uh, so we, we worked with her, and actually she entered into getting a master's degree. But the devil will do everything he can to get you to minimize who you are to misperceive yourself and others. Again, in the context of your destiny and the tools that God has given you to reach destiny. Now, I know that those examples are very strong, but the bottom line is this. God wants us to be in a place where, man, we are so excited about destiny and, and, and seeing the tools that God's given us. In Mark 4, 24, the Bible says, take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear it. Amen. Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear it. God wants you to hear the right thing. Amen. He wants you to hear who you are. He wants you to hear of the tools given you to reach destiny. So when you hear something, for example, you know, this uh, is entitled the power of the written word. When I say that, the power of the written word Every person here listening, here right now, or watching by DVD or listening by CD, a, a different meaning comes into your mind. When you hear the power of the written word, some person might be a Christian a long time, and as soon as they hear that, they think, man, I've heard 50 sermons on that, and just turn it off right now. Some people might say, wow. That is really exciting. I know my faith is based on the word and I can't wait to hear uh, so I can enter into a greater level of revelation regarding the written word. Because there's 30, 60, and 100 fold in everything we do. And we're going to go from 30 to 60 to 100 to good, to better, to best. Somebody else might hear that and say, you know what? I'm really not sure about that. Because you might be struggling with the enemy telling you, you know what? The word of God just really isn't, man, you know, that was just written by a group of guys. You know, it's fallible, it's this or that. Again, everybody listening 
has a different connotation, a different meaning you ascribe to what you hear when you hear the power of the written word. God wants to take us to a place but when you hear that, first of all, you relate it to you. Again, God doesn't want you to have the idea this is for somebody else. Amen? Well, this is, you know, Billy Graham can lead people to Jesus. Or, you know, Kenneth Copeland has this great faith. Or David Hogan, yeah, does all these miracles. Stuff, or Heidi Baker does all this. He wants you to understand it's you. Amen? And then he wants you to be so excited about it. Man, that... Oh, man, it's just amazing. It is simply amazing in regards to what this can do for your life. So let's just look at some things regarding the written word to start out. One, God's greatest desire is open relationship. Did you ever hear people say that aren't Christians, you know, they just talk about blind faith? They really don't understand what Christianity is. They see eternal life in something that's a possibility that you hope for, but they don't see it in in really what's tangible, reality. Amen? It's blind faith. Well, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. God's greatest desire is open relationship. He wants us to enter into a relationship that's so viable. Man, it's just like... Just like if I'm looking at somebody here, I, you can, I can see them. I can talk to them. Amen. They can hear me. They can see me. That's what he, he wants. That's what he died for. Open relationship. No, we still have to live by faith because I, I don't see God in the natural. Like, like I, I see John running the camera or somebody else here. But it can be that viable. So open relationship. You know, um, when you're going through a trial, you know, when you're being tested, you know, the good thing about the test is that it's open book. Amen? (laughs) Glory to God. It's open book. You can refer to this book during the time of testing. And the natural, if you take an open book test, it's a lot easier. Amen? Praise God than uh, a test that's not open. So that, we need to see that. So the written word is that which is open. Glory to God. It's that which is, man, it's right in front of us. Go with me to John 1.1. 1, 1. We know these verses, but they're so powerful. In John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whew. In John 1.14, we see the Word became flesh. In Revelation 19, it says that when Jesus comes back, Everybody is going to see him, and on his forehead is going to be written the word of God. Woo! Amen? Praise God. I mean, he's all about the word. You know what I'm saying? Glory to God. I mean, it's it's one thing to say, I am the word. It's another thing to have it stamped on your forehead. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Glory to God. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing to like, you know, football, but it's another thing to name your kid touchdown. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a different deal. God, really, he wants us to understand that it, he, it's all about the word. Glory to Jesus. It's all about the word. Mm. You know, a lot of times people try to make things so complicated. I really, and God wants to make it simple. How many know the simple is good? Amen. Amen. The older I get, I tell you, the more simple, I tell you, simple gets better and better. But simple is always good. Simple is good. You know, I'm firmly convinced if, you know, if people are presented with something simple as opposed to, you know, if you have to jump all through these religious hoops and, and, you know, read a thousand books and do this and do that and do this and do that and then break all these codes. How many people get into all this stuff? Can I tell you something? You don't have to break a code. It's, it's right here, okay? And, but they're into stuff like that. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11. Let not the simplicity that is in Christ be a stumbling block to you and corrupt your minds. Now, I talk to professors and college, you know, all, all the time. And it's like, they can drive you nuts. Because they're always looking for something complicated. Amen. And Jesus could be complicated if he wanted to be, but he's chosen not to be. Glory to God. 
And what is first and foremost is the word of God. Hallelujah. And it's amazing, you know, if, if, we, if, if we just, if you looked up and for the next day in the sky, it was written, I am God and I am going to write down something in a book, one page to tell me who I am, tell you who I am and what I'm about. People, I mean, that's all you'd be hearing, right? Or what if he, if he just made it prolonged and said a year from today, amen? Hallelujah, a year from today. And it was in the sky for 365 days. I am God and in one year, I am going to write down in a book. I'm going to put the book in a certain building in a certain place for everybody to see who, to tell you who I am, how to have a relationship with me. Would people be excited? Sure they would be. That's all you'd be hearing about, right? Well, God has done more than that. He's given us his book. Amen? He's given us his word so we can enter into open relationship with him. All right, let's try to, you know, let's start getting more and more specific. Uh, go with me, if you would, to, uh, well, there's so much here. Romans chapter 10. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verses 5. We're going to start with verse 5. But before that, let's just, th- I want you to think about one, one other thing. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How many of you know you, you cannot differentiate, segregate, separate your word from who you are? Your word is who you are. Man, I, about midnight, the Lord woke me up, and I was just thinking about this. I got so excited. I know it sounds so simple, but so powerful. And he says, any scripture that you read, any scripture that you read, it's who I am. In Luke twenty two fifty one, 51, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they're coming to take Jesus, Peter took a sword. People think that Peter was cowardly. Peter was not cowardly. He did not deny Jesus three times because he was a coward. He was somebody that was very heroic. Somebody that was, to say the least, willing to risk his life. He denied Jesus because he didn't understand what was going on. But he takes off his sword, takes out his sword, and man, he cuts off this, uh, the, 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 one of the guys that's coming to apprehend him. Just, he cuts off his ear, and, and, and you read in the Amplified, he take, the guy's dying. You know if Peter cuts off your ear, half your head's going to go with it. You know what I'm saying? So the guy's ear is gone. There's blood gushing out of his head. The guy's, he's dying. Jesus says to Peter, put back your sword. Then he goes to the guy that's going to take him to kill him, right? The Bible says he touches his head and in front of everybody. You think it's sort of about repentance, but it didn't. In front of everybody, the guy's head comes back that was cut off. The ear that was completely gone that everybody saw was on the ground. It's, and there's a creative miracle that takes place. One of the greatest creative miracles that ever took place that the Bible records. Wow. Now, someone says, okay, That's pretty awesome. But here's the key, guys. Here's the amazing thing. God doesn't put anything down in his word that doesn't tell us who he is. See, that tells us he is a God of creative miracles who will create what is necessary as we believe him when there's a need. You know, I've shared this before, but I think it bears repetition. Last time David Hogan was here. In be, you know, he was here, I can't remember, a Thursday and a Friday or something, Wednesday, Thursday. Well, so he preached it one night, and then we had, a few of us had lunch with him. I don't know, it must have been about 15, 20 of us. And uh, had lunch at somebody's house. And we were just asking him some questions. And I, I was just trying to, then I, I had some time with him just by myself. We talked for a while, but I, I, just, I knew that there's numerous occasions where he was ministering to people that had absolutely no legs, and to the point where they could not get artificial legs because it just wouldn't work. 
And, and I said, I, you know, because I've heard him share this testimony. I said, can you just tell us uh, how these legs came about and how you're able to minister to this guy? And, you know, he said, well, first the guy we got, we, we led him to Jesus, of course. And he said, I went down to his house. He was a wealthy man, the one guy. And uh, actually a servant in his house who went to one of the churches that they started, talked to him about the Lord and said, I know how you can get new legs. Wow. He said, how? He thought, you know, there was uh, artificial legs. And she said, Jesus. And he threw her out, fired her. And then she was at markets. And uh, bottom line is his heart, he got convicted and brought her back. And then she brought Brother David and another pastor. And they just talked to him over a period of, uh, I think it was like six weeks. But see, David, one of the scriptures that was utilized is what I just shared. God, this is Jesus. See, the word in Luke twenty two fifty one. 51, this is not about Jesus. This is Jesus. If you get that, that'll change your life. I remember going to a church denomination. They're very uh, liberal. And, but this particular church was a good church. It was in East Pittsburgh, Penn Hills. A friend of ours is one of the elders there, so I went there to share. And, and the pastor would just weep, and he said, you know, I have to leave the denomination. I said, what? He said, because they're believing in everything and anything. Just because, they said, instead of saying the Bible is the word of God, they say the Bible contains the word of God. That's not good, because then you get to pick and choose what is the Word of God. But the bottom line is, this: the Bible's not about Jesus. It is Jesus. See, when David was ministering this guy, he said, Jesus is a God that, that creates legs. Because the Scripture says. So he has a revelation in that. Glory to God. And legs came. Numerous occasions. So he just said, you know, it's the Gospel. See, this gets you, it gets exciting. It gets exciting. Glory to God. Romans 10, 5 to 11. It's just so good. I, for, oh man, there's just so much here. Oh. Let's start with verse 6. It says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this was, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down, or who shall descend the deep that is to bring Christ up. It's saying that we don't have to do anything else. It say, but what does it say? The word is nigh thee, the word of God, the written word of God, even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Wow. That if you should confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes and with unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes in me should not be ashamed or disappointed. Now, the word for confession that's utilized in these scriptures we just read twice is the word homo logos. Homo means the same. Logos means written word. Okay, the written word of God. Now, it literally means saying the same thing that God says saying the same thing that God says. See, here's where we get into trouble. We let the devil make things so difficult. Why would you want to say something different than God says? See, the prayer that starts in heaven is the prayer that will be answered by heaven. This word started from heaven. Amen? Glory to God. It wasn't written by men. It was written by the Spirit of God. You know, if I, if I write a, a message, a letter, I, you know, and someone says, who wrote that? They, they don't say the pen wrote it. He said, no, the person wrote it. God wrote it. He used men as pens. So, it's saying the same thing God said. Wow. The Word is God that came down from heaven. Hallelujah. It produces faith. Faith is believing that word, then speaking it, saying the same thing God says, believing that when God hears what he already has ordained, he will confirm it. God is not going to confirm what you think. God is not going to confirm what's politically correct. God is not going to confirm what's religiously correct in someone's eyes. God will only confirm himself. Because he's the only one that's righteous. 
And his word is his righteousness. So we get into all this stuff. How am I going to make God come down? How am I going to get God to move from me? How am I going to make it happen? And books are written and religiosity comes in and techniques and this, this, and this. And God's saying, I've given what you need to make it happen. Man, if you, if you need a stick of dynamite, maybe to blow something up so you can get like in a door or something, you know what? The dynamite, if it's, if the dynamite's there, the key is just lighting the fuse. When you agree with God, you light the fuse. The word's the dynamite. Amen? Glory to God. Now, I know this sounds simple, but when you get it, it's so powerful. Now, let's look at this in the, in the life of Jesus. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. Now here's Jesus and how he ministered. Praise God. Oh man, it, to me this is just, mm. Luke 4, 15 and he taught in their synagogues being glorified at all. What you have to know is just like man, even in our area, there's thousands of churches, you know what I'm saying? Throughout Pennsylvania, right? Tens of thousands of churches in our country. In Israel, just like there's almost a church in every street here, there was a synagogue in every little town. Now, there weren't many temples. There was the great temple, and then there were some other temples. But there were synagogues all over the place, okay? So Jesus went in to the synagogues, all right, just like somebody would go into a church, and, and it says that uh, he, he was glorified law. Now, listen to this. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, all right, now we're in verse 16. And as was his custom, in the Greek it says, he did this all the time. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, sat down, and the eyes of them in the synagogue were all on him. And he began to say unto them, again to teach them, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And all those there, they didn't receive it. They said, isn't this Joseph's son? Man, isn't this the carpenter? See, in those days, it, they were real big, just like we have seminaries. I mean, they had schools that you went to to become rabbis. Paul uh, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of his time. That's why he knew the scriptures so well. They said, this guy is uneducated. He's a carpenter. Who's this guy? But here's what I want you to see. If you get this and you translate it into your life, it, it'll change your life. Man, Jesus could have came into that town and just blowing these guys away. He could have come in and he, he said, here's the deal, guys. I was just with God on the Mount of Transfiguration and I just got glorified. Touch my clothes and be healed. He could have said that. He could have said, man, let me share with you the, the latest vision I had of the Father. He didn't do any of that. He never did that. Because he didn't want their faith to be on the vision or on the experience. He wanted their faith to be on the word of God. Amen. Could he have shared some pretty neat visions? Could he, after he came down from the mountain, see we read the, the story of transfiguration. That happened to Jesus all the time. Why do you think when they touched him, they always got healed? When he touched his clothes? Because he got when he prayed all the time, and when he prayed, that was a normal experience. He could have said, yeah, you think I'm the carpenter's son? Really? Come up here. Just come up and touch me. You know? <laughs> no, maybe he's not more than the carpenter's son. He could have done that. But he didn't. You know what he did? He did it the same way that you and I are to do it. See, he, as a man, he divested himself of his divinity, according to Philippians 2. He's a man just like you and me. 
He had to get revelation through the Spirit of God just like you and I. Now, when we get revelation, we find out who he is. When he got revelation, he found out who he is. You see what I'm saying? Who he was. He's the Messiah. Man, he's reading this. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. He's saying, this is me. The devil probably came against him just like he came against you. When you say, man, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, the devil says, really? Man, when he got there, the devil probably said, you're a carpenter. He's saying, I am the son of God. The devil's saying, you're a carpenter, man. But see, he got this in his spirit. He knows that he's the Messiah. He knows he's the son of God that, that came supernaturally in the womb of Mary. He knows this is who he is. So every synagogue he went to, he didn't come up with a different message. Every synagogue he walked into, as was his custom, he got out the word, the same word you have. He got out the word, and he read it. And then he said this, today, what's written is going to manifest Jesus' whole ministry revolved first and foremost around the written word of God. People, a lot of people don't like hearing that. It's too simple. I like hearing it. <laughs> I like simple. But it's so powerful. Because what are you going to build? I mean, how, what are you going to get this better? The word of God. Man, when God says, you know, galaxies be into existence, they came into existence, and they're still growing. <sighs> wow. Glory to God. So this is Jesus. Man, I, I was just, you know, praying and seeking God the last couple of days, and I was just ministering. He said, man, he said, I could not have <laughs> done anything more than, than minister the written word, because there's no higher form of power, of open relationship, of that which produces faith, of that which the Spirit of God will confirm than the written word. I'm all for testimonies. It's awesome. Gifts of the Spirit, yes. We're going to talk about the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the witness of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All good. But the word comes first. Glory to God. I'll share something. I think it'll help you. Uh, not long ago at all, I had uh, a pastor friend of mine who had someone in his church, and they were down south in Florida area, in Florida. And this young man, uh, uh, the son of these parents, was just really struggling. He had been abused when he was younger, and he's a really good athlete. And uh, he's in college, and really, really good athlete. And this is recently, and Anyway, somebody else, this kid's a, I mean, this, he's just a tough guy, really good athlete. I mean, you wouldn't want to mess with this kid. And somebody else tried to do the same thing. And long story short, he, he froze. He just couldn't, and he was in condemnation, fear. Kid was suicidal. They flew him up. The mother came with him. Dad couldn't. So they flew up. And really, nicest kid. And we came down and talked. He said, you know, he said, I'm so afraid. He said, I can't believe that. And, and God was so good because in this last time someone walked in, everything was, you know, he was not hurt. And he said, I can't believe that happened. And he was, he really, kid was suicidal. And I mean, this kid's a really, really good athlete. I won't get more specific, but he just a really good athlete. And, uh, and this, real, this is recent. And so I said, okay. So we're just talking. And we shared a really nice kid, Christian from a young age, really good family. And the mom was there with me, and then she is just in another room while I talked to him. And uh, here's what's interesting. You know, your heart goes out to someone, like, because he's so fearful that this is going to happen to him again. He's so fearful that he's going to uh, not be able to respond like he should. Condemnation, really suicidal deal. And... I'll be honest with you, my heart went out so strongly, but there's no gifts of the Spirit that manifested. And I'm looking, and, you know, there's no, there's no voice of God. There's nothing. 
And this is real recent. And I, and I took them. I said, you know, you're Christian. I said, I said, I know you know this verse. I said, I know that you know this verse. But I did something real simple. He says, we're to be conformed to the image of Jesus. If you're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus, well, then act like Jesus, right? What did Jesus do when he wanted to help people? He went to the Word. So I just took them to a verse that you know. Turn here with Philippians 4.13. And he knew right off. I said, here's the deal. I said, Jesus is going to set you free in a way that you will never fear again, ever. And you will be in control. And, and you know, he was kind of like, I, I know this verse, just like you do. So we, we went to the word, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then we read it from the Amplified. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. What did he need? He needed empowerment, right? Right? I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. Whoa! Whoa! And he started to get excited. I started to get excited. See, what do you have to understand? When this kid walked out, he's he's a mess. But now, he's he's starting to get excited. I'm starting to get excited. I know this verse. But here's the most exciting thing about it. It's like Jesus is right there with us. I can't help this kid. What am I going to do? Man, you, you and I, if our lives depended on it, couldn't heal a mosquito's, you know, eyelash. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't make a blade of grass to grow. What are you going to do? Really? The Bible says that I read, you can do nothing of yourself. What's nothing? Nothing. Amen. But now we're excited. Wow. And it says, I am self-sufficient and cross-sufficiency. We start talking about what that meant. And I said, man. I, and the word of God started to come alive in him. And it was like Jesus was right there. But it wasn't like Jesus was just in the midst of us. It was like Jesus was in the midst of him rising up within him. And here's a young man, 19 years old. He never went to seminary. He's not a Bible preacher. He's not this or that. But you know what he is? He's a child of God. He is somebody that God had made a way for through the written word to walk in victory. This is a true story. I mean, he walked out. And I'm still doing some. I'll do some counseling with them, you know, phone-wise. Obviously, he's not going to fly up every day type of deal but here's the exciting thing he walked as God is my witness he walked out of there and I asked him I said are you strong he looked at me he said I'm strong I said are you afraid he said I'm not afraid I said are you free he walked honest to gosh he walked out of there I mean he walked out of there like you think Jesus this is the truth and this and I mean it, it's like wow then I went back, I wrote down in my notebook. I just said, thank you, Jesus. I wrote about three different places. But the last thing we said, I said, you, and then I said, I said, you are strong. And you're free. Wow. Again, secular counseling would have had this kid, who, who knows what. Religion would have had this kid Worse off than when he came in. Because you know what religion tries to do? It tries to bring Jesus down through your good works. Well, you know what? Maybe if you read these 10 books and fast these 10 days, and your mom does this, and we do this, and we do that, uh, maybe Jesus will come. Or we try to bring Jesus up. There's nothing you can do to bring him down in in your good work. There's nothing you can do to bring him up. What did Romans 10 say? What saith it? The word of faith. It is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. It was in this kid's heart all the time. Now it came out his mouth. And now the Jesus that walked the earth 2,000 years ago, that's inside of him, 
is walking through this young man now. Wow. I understand when you're in a time of need, it's natural to say, I'll do anything to bring Jesus down. It's natural to say, I'll do anything to bring him on the scene. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pray or fast or that type of thing. But it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Mm-hmm. Can I tell you something? You don't change God by fasting. Really. Fasting will change you. <laughs> it ain't going to change him. He's as good as he's going to get. Can I tell you something? When you're done fasting, it's still going to come back to the word. It's still going to come back to the word. As we close today, I, I want to encourage you. Because the devil will do everything he can to come against this. Well, that's too simple. You tried that before and it didn't work. Yes, yeah, so-and-so tried this and it Can I tell you something? All I can tell you is this. Jesus tried it and it worked. And he said, what worked for me, I now, by my spirit, I'm going to make it work for you. That's the gospel. You didn't make it work. Man, Adam and Eve, which represent all of us, didn't make it work. So Jesus came and made it work and said, you know what? Here's the deal. Instead of getting what came from Adam and Eve, now you got what comes from me. And what worked for me by my piety and my righteousness, not through my spirit, is going to work for you as you believe. As you exalt the word of God. God says, I exalt my word above my name. And she said, God, I believe. Because I believe I will speak. And when you speak, it will come to pass. Simple, too simple for many. Real. It's what Jesus died to give us. In John 17, we didn't even look at this. Jesus said, I'm going to the cross that I might give you the new covenant scriptures. Wow. It's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting. Glory to God. So I want to encourage you, if you're fighting discouragement, if you're fighting, you know, just inability, get back to the basics. And then accentuate the glory of the written word. We're going to enter into a lot more things with this because there's so much multifaceted. But I, I want to I, I encourage you. Keep it before your eyes. Get it in your heart. Fellowship around it. Man, magnify. It says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's what church is about. And I will perform miracles. Amen.